What are your chill shades? Um, so your chill cat? This is my chill cat, yes. <laughs> I'm going to try to send this to... Jaren's on a, like a shuttle bus. <laughs> Get him out of there. <laughs> trying to expect... Did you guys see the email of, him, of Jason falling out of the... Um... I absolutely did. I showed it to Kayla. I was dying laughing. And I said, I said, this is exactly what I thought when Jaron told me he was going to Costa Rica with Jason. Wait, they're both oh. there? Yes. It's their, I think it's their honeymoon. They're, uh, they're honeymooning in uh, Costa Rica. Wait, I don't have that email. It's the group, it's the uh, shop email I sent that last night. I'm like, I don't know what time it was. Oh, righty then. So uh, I'm just going to start off. This is not Jaron Pearson. This is Jay Alling and Berkshire Biking Board, joined by Thomas Spencer and Bill Wright, doing our Friday shop rags uh, jibber jabber with a bunch of jabronis. Jaron wanted to start this off this year. He was psyched about the road race season coming up, and he just wanted to get some homies on the chat rooms and uh, in person talking about the upcoming road racing season. And Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Spoiler alert, Wout Van Aert versus Matthew Vanderpool. That was the first bit of uh, news that I wanted to talk about was just what these guys do year after year. Isn't it crazy how these guys just race all fall and then go into a road season and just hammer? What do you guys have to say? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane that they go from cyclocross plus mountain biking because you look at Pickcock and all these other guys so right. It's like a a, a three way on that whole thing, but it's it's insane the power that they have in any of these forms. The same thing, just like right. this one you're watching right now, Jay, where Vanderpool just absolutely dominates at that last little sprint. But they've been racing all they they were racing all summer. They had their debut or one of their you know leading debut Tour de France seasons in 2022 summer, and then they're racing all fall. And then they're just gonna go right into it into the classics. Like I just don't like. I watch you guys race on Zwift, and I'm like, how do you guys race on Zwift all winter long, and then go into the road season and not be just totally over riding your bike? Um, but these guys are just on another level. I gotta say, Wout Van Aert in particular is insane. That guy won like six cyclocross races in a row. He basically won the Tour de France for Jonas Vingegaard. Right, he was a man, right hand man. I mean, he's like he's on it. He's in another world. Matthew Vanderpool's. I love that guy. He's probably top five easy. But you would. I'm think I'm pretty sure Bill feels the same way. He loves Vanderpool too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, this is this is the thing. Like Steph and I, I like years ago when I first started working in the shop. I got a TV put on the wall. We started watching bike racing in the shop. And I was stoked about watching cyclocross. Whatever it took to get cyclocross on the TV, we were watching it on Saturdays and Sundays. And Stefan was like, who is this guy, Wout Van Aer? Like, who is this guy, Matthew Vanderpool? Like, this is seven, eight, seven years ago. Right. These kids were, these guys were kids. Right. And then they start riding in, like, you know, the road circuit. And people are like, okay, who are these guys? And Stefan and I are like, yeah, we've been watching them. They've been coming up. So, so fun that's to watch a, them. That's the thing. They've been racing since they were kids. They literally have been through, like, from teens to this whole stage, right? I mean, adulthood right. in this kind of racing is your mid-20s, maybe 30. But it's these guys have not stopped. It's It's like hammer from start to finish for an hour on cyclocross but then on the road it's a whole different ball game they're just have you guys seen the uh that uh amstel gold race that matthew vanderpool won have you seen that one bill no that, oh, that, that the last bit at the end is it the oh my god is insane i mean this podcast could go on and on but so this last i'm gonna finish this off this race is epic spoiler alert Matthew Vanderpool just dusts Wout into the gate right there, into the fence. I mean, imagine being there, like, you're watching these guys go around eight or nine times within the hour. Being in that crowd would be freaking amazing. Bill, this is this is what we should catch. This yeah. is what we got. Yeah, yeah. 
Like a classic is cool and all, but going to a cyclocross race in Belgium or, or the Netherlands, that would be. Woo. But it's I, also I, like, I, it's, oh, a, it's it, yeah, sorry. It's, I think, you know, especially with the cyclocross and these guys in Belgium, it's also bringing it into like crit racing in in you know the right. u.s right so it's it's more exciting when you can watch these dudes go around nine times hammering right. you know what i mean heart rate at like 190 for an hour to just right. like vanderpool here like a total collapse at the end yeah. just the adre the adrenaline of that whole thing is is insane but then to bring it to a three hour stage and then also unleash you know 1500 watts for right. the last 300 meters is is bonkers right i mean and then this so this brings me to my next subject so the next thing i want to talk about was a volta san juan um kind of a crazy road scene going on race scene going on these open streets and it's like like just like we're talking about watching these uh cyclocross races for an hour look at all those spectators right like there's so many variables like in the san juan race there is it's the road furniture the road furniture and all these freaking like they're trying to navigate these That's hundred on this side of the road road yeah. down these public roads they got road dividers they got spectators moving across the streets like it's just amazing the sport how much money they put into it the sponsors the bike companies people the professionals dedicating their livelihood to racing on these open roads where in cyclocross how, like I was watching the Celtics last night. Like, there's a lucky few that get to pay a ton of money to sit front row, but in cyclocross and in not road racing, you're like sitting in the front row. You can like reach out and touch these people. Like, isn't it amazing how this sport? You're up close and personal with these these freaking professionals. Coming up it's in awesome. this video, you can see like how many, these spectators almost got so messed up. But yeah, what were you gonna say, Bob? It's it's not only just the close and personal of the spectators, but how tight these dudes are riding in that peloton, and with that road furniture, like you're you're the sixtieth dude back, you have no idea that that split is coming. It, it's so sketchy. But not even the professionals. Look at this. Like the the road furniture isn't even like a concrete pillar. It's multiple people standing in the middle of this road. It's nuts. It is Maybe amazing. To sketchy as hell. But they're also in their time trial bike looking at the ground and their computers. But still, I mean, you still have a you still have a car in front of you that you're supposed to follow or a motorbike or whatever. And yeah, I mean it's but they're it's coming in 90 degree turns and they're on a TT bike. Yeah, sure. Oh, so they're doing the best they can. This one, I mean <laughs> right there. Look at there's a lady well, standing had to go around here because they couldn't even jump back in or that person I don't know if it's a male or female but they couldn't even they had to go all the way around her and then converge again well but the, the thing with this was like they were supposed to take this wide bending turn and end up in the right lane but a bunch of them ended up in the left lane so right. they're splitting this road divider so it looks like we lost Bill but uh, up oh, there's Bill yeah sorry uh, man no it's all good so um that was the uh Volta San Juan Argentina road racing, cyclocross racing, up close and personal. It's amazing what these guys are going through, racing on the road. Um, next one, this short. I want to show this short clip of uh, Johan Bernil. We're gonna go off onto a tangent of. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about the move. Very controversial crew of boys over there yeah, but at least the sun has come out it's a very major descent on the Cormier de Rose oh my goodness me oh my and goodness that uh, is a rider right of the bank who has gone clean off into this ravine here on the descent of the Cormier de Roseland and in fact it is Johan Brunil who these guys put it all on the line okay. it's like every Tuesday night Wednesday night we're out there on the road right the boys and in fact, yeah, sweet helmet. This, this man is just looking for another bike. Sweet helmet. I doubt whether they'll get no the problem. Got right, right out of the, the wherever he went. A great <laughs> no problem. Right back on the bike. On the mountain, straight I thought this was great. But the drugs were a little different back then, right? Stronger. Or just different. A lot. A lot Much stronger. stronger. Well, anyways, that's Johan Bernil, who's kind of Lance Armstrong's George Incapi's right hand man. 
Team Postal, part of the whole doping debacle in whatever era that was, pre my time. So I just think they're the coolest guys. If you want to have a great podcast to listen to while you're watching the Tour de France, Lance and the crew really do touch on all the nuance, ins and outs of racing in the Tour de France. Lots of cool stories from Johan Bernal. Do you know? Do you guys listen to Johan? I I have not, um, and I don't. I haven't really watched the move either. But I'm down to start. I, so I, I actually watch it religiously. I I think it's super funny. You know, I don't know. I, years ago, I met Lance actually as a and Jay. You know, like as a photographer, I was out in Colorado and I got right. a job assisting for Bicycling Magazine, and we photographed Lance after he won the first tour. Right. And sat in a room, listened to him give this whole interview, and I've just kind of followed him since. I agree he's a little bit of a douche, and he definitely, like, led everyone in kind of the wrong direction, but ultimately admitted to the uh, the whole scheme at the end. But if you think about, like, everything he's been through, and if you put it in the scale of your own life, right? I mean, all these different sports from football, baseball, all that they're all doping no matter what right mark mcguire sammy sosa home run derby it's like exploding it's the best thing you got all these pitchers throwing you know 110 mile an hour fastballs for you know you know 100 pitches dude they're all on it he you know they just get caught up in it but i think you know jb squared that is such a good podcast if you want to get like deep into what the tour is or even any of those races right it's like they're super into it him can't be it's good have like a comedic piece of it and i just i love that whole show can i ask a question does they do they openly talk about yeah. doping or is it just them commentating on on current affairs like do they ever go back and be like well in our day when we were taking like do they self-deprecate or is it just sort of i think a couple times they do hit on the fact that it was a little bit you know things are a little bit stronger back in the day maybe yeah. but they all know what's behind him lance he's not talking about it on the show but he's like oh, I mean, they're moving forward like he's moving forward um yeah. like there was one cool jd squared story where it was like jo- johan Bernil was talking about like racing the what do you call those crits in um in europe like kermis or whatever where they're all betting on these crits right in europe it's huge and he's talking about throwing the race where it's like he was supposed to be the guy to win but then he cramps up and he couldn't even pull through on his his part of the bet so he pretty much like yeah they're open about like they've already been exposed for doping, but then he's Joe, Johan Bernil is talking about throwing these races and yeah, like they, betting, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, like they're putting it all on the line. Like that, that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, obviously everyone watching the podcast is probably aware of their history. Right. Yeah. But I guess my question is, is I think that's, uh, maybe I've caught like glimpses of it, but I, I always was like, oh, I feel like they're not, no, they, I mean, Maybe. not that they need to talk about it every show, but like just the fact that right. it's, it's yeah. happened and they don't like discredit it. It's, you know, yeah, he's got an not. asterisk next to his name kind of thing. But yeah, no, there's no like disclaimer. There's no disclaimer that like, pops up in the beginning and say, yeah, like, right. you guys dope. And like, yeah, but they put on the line and they, they bring in, I mean, it's funny. Like Lance Armstrong is literally Jared. Like he's just this guy knows too yeah. much too cool his way is is the way to go um and it's all balanced out with like jb hager um george hincapi and uh, johan Bernil. they really are a good team that like balances it all out i love it i'll, so, dive, I'll dive into it yeah jb squared so jb squared is jb hager up here he's like an austin re- announced sport sporting announcer and then uh johan Bernil in the top right of that quadrant George Hankappy on the right, and obviously Lance, Lancey Poo down there. That's the move. That's JB Hager. The last thing, I this is this is something that I did not send in the link. This is kind of news that just popped up. So you guys might know that this guy right here, our favorite little oh, cyclist. Um, looks like he's gonna be retiring. Um, his last race as a professional looks like it's gonna be the 2024 Olympic mountain bike race. So it's not how old it's not is exciting that news, but like, uh... I think he's like 33. 
Yeah, I think he is too. I think he's like 33 or 34. Nairo, I thought Nairo Quintana was going to retire too. I thought that, but not the case. 33. 33. How old's Nairo? I think he's 33 as well. Or some, uh, maybe, I don't know. Let's let's Google it. Google, Googling. 32. How, how old is Jay Vine? Jay Vine is young, like 20 right. something. He's 21. 27. So think about that, dude, right? This is circle back to like what Jay was saying, riding like Zwift races through the winter. This dude is hammering and came pro out of a out of a computer. Like right. he was like, he's like playing video games, and next thing you know, he's like winning world tours. Right. I mean, that that to me is the crazy part. And that's why these dudes at 33 are like calling it. Cause you got this, you know, me, this dude's in his high twenties, but they're coming out of nowhere. Cause they're yeah. they're just hammering all year long that's like uh jonas fingergar he's probably i think that, I, I love that these, i love that like that dude has started dominating right to come out of like a nowhere i mean you know obviously he's riding his bike but he wasn't like moving up through the ranks i mean he moved up through the zwift academy right during think, COVID. That's, a, that's a different that's, world dude yeah i mean covid created a different world I feel like yeah 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 for sure there's a great uh podcast I watch sometimes I watch the EF cycling podcast um yeah. with their coaches and they inter were interviewing Jonathan Botters team manager for yeah he, he, he was saying basically that you know they're starting to scout kids that are like 15 16 because the internet in COVID and everything, you can just put everything out there so easily for people to pick up. And, you know, the riders under 23 right now are so strong. It's crazy. Like Tade Pogachar and Remco Evnipol, all those guys are super young and they're insanely powerful. Right. So, tangent. Tade is 24. He's 24 now, but yeah, I mean, that, well, yeah, that dude, but he's also like, what did it say in there? Like, you know, these guys are just, if you look at some of the EF team. Now we're just javelin. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think we can leave it here. This is some great content for Jaron to make him happy. He's going to be uh, missing out when he comes, uh, when he gets back and sees this up uploaded to YouTube. What's the, uh, We'll do it again. Thanks for everyone for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us a like. Tell all your friends. Berkshire Bike and Board, your local internet bike shop. What do you guys think of that? Right? We're like a local like, brick and mortar on the internet. Like, come on. I, your local I like internet the, bike shop. Your local we're, internet bike shop. We're going to like open a, we're just going to like get a credit card and like start buying Canyon bikes online <laughs> and then like put them on the floor. And... Dude, nothing wrong with a Canyon bike, bro. Canyon. Hey, we just, should. We, we're gonna do a YouTube live video and start getting start getting content, start getting people to contact. I mean, that's, that's what we should. Why don't we go into Costa Rica? What is? How does this dude go there? What, what's going on? Jaron. Yeah. How does this dude go there? Jaron. So right. like, there's. Like, All fairness, though, I do have to go back to work. Yeah, there's this like cycling like management organization that they work with. I think they paid for the, for the for the lodging and the and the whitewater rafting, but they had to get themselves there. So Jason and Jaron went. That's right, though.